morning. <clears throat> um, I have the privilege of sharing the word of God today with you guys. So, um, this past week, Friday was Valentine's Day. Um, I want to show you this. This is what I did on Valentine's. I cooked. I cooked for my wife. She is, she loves seafood. So rather than going to a restaurant, I decided to cook for her. Now, I'm not the best cook, but I can cook when I decide to cook. And so I cooked for her, and so that is the, it's, it's muscle, it's fresh muscle, so you have to clean every one of them, like individually. You have to clean it, because there's hairs in it, there's like slimy things on it, right? So you got to clean it, and then you get fresh uh, uh, shrimp, you got to cut it, you got to cut that little nasty little string of intestine, right? And then you got to cut the legs and peel it. So that's the aftermath. So she was very touched. I was hoping for that, but she actually was touched. And actually, the good part was that it actually tasted good too. So I have never seen my wife actually finish her entire plate. And in this instance, she actually finished it all. So we had a, a, a good time uh, just at our house and uh, just enjoying uh, that kind of like a couple hours of relaxing day because me, me and my wife, we don't have uh, too much of a relaxing time. So that was pretty good. Now, the reason I'm showing this is because this has nothing to do with our today's message at all. I didn't have any intro to kind of go with the message today, and I was thinking, what can I show you guys to get your interest perked up? I said, you know what, let me just share, you know, it was Valentine's Day, so let me just show you this, okay? So that was my Valentine's. Hopefully your Valentine was, 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 was well taken and that you guys had a good time. All right, let, now let's go into the Word of God. <laughs> All right, today's Word, it comes from now, Pastor Joe, for the last... Since September, he's been preaching to us about a Christian life, how to fundamentally, fundamentally and practically live out a, your Christian faith. And we went through the entire book of James, and today is the last message on James. It's the last four verses, and that is where I want to share with you, and we will kind of cap this Serious on Christian life. So if you can read, uh, um, follow me as I read James chapter 5, verse 17 through 20. It says, Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly and that he would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for, the, for three and a half years. Again he prayed, uh, and then the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from, a error, from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Now, there's a lot to kind of get to today. Um, now, if you look at these two verses, verse 17 uh, and 18, it talks about prophet Elijah. And it talks about his prayer that he prayed for a drought. And then God answered him. And then he prayed again. And then there came rain. And then, verse 19 and 20, it goes on to saying that if you bring a person back to God, those who have been backsliding perhaps, those who have lost their faith, and went against the truth, if you bring them back, it says, you will save them from death and cover multitude of sins. Now, if you just look at this, they don't really flow together, does it not, huh? Because if I read this correctly, I mean, just, so just by looking at it, verse 17, I mean, you know what? Oh, yeah, if I pray earnestly, if I pray with passion, and if I scream and loud and whatever... God is going to do what? He will, it's going to answer my prayers. But, if, but the context is very important here. 
We have to understand the context in which Elijah is praying for this thing. And once we understand the context, then we will understand that these two verses, these four verses, go hand in hand. So with that, let's go, let's go to the Old Testament. I know some of us don't like Old Testament. I tend to love Old Testament. Um, but uh, so let's go into 1 Kings uh, chapter 16, verse 30. This is where we need to begin. This is where King Ahab comes into power. And he says here, Ahab, son of uh, uh, Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. Now, the funny thing is this. This guy, this guy is known for his evil. His predecessor, meaning his father and his father before him, they were all evil as well. But this guy topped it all. And, and this guy, what this guy did was this. He did more evil in the eyes of the Lord by marrying a foreign wo woman named Jezebel. And not only that, through that marriage, he introduces the worship of Baal. And then he sets up all the altars of Baal, and then he also makes Asherah poles. And then he encourages and he leads the Israel Israelites to worship Baal instead of God. Not only that, Baal, this religion is so evil, and I mentioned this, I think, last time in, uh, on a Wednesday service, is this, that they sacrifice their own babies. They'll have orgies while they're sacrificing their kids, their, their, their infant babies. They will burn live babies. Not only that, as they also, there was this called a foundation sacrifice, meaning if you're building a, a structure to bless that foundation, they will bury their children along with the foundation. This was hideous, hideous in the eyes of God. This was pure evil. Now, because of this, as we move into 1 Kings uh, chapter 17, we see Elijah come into play. It says, verse 17, verse 1, it says, Now Elijah the uh, Tis Tisbite from T uh, Tishbe of Galia said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. This is where we see the drought comes into play. See? This context, right, is very important because without understanding this, if we go back to James, we could easily, easily interpret verse 17 as say, you know what, if I pray earnestly, God's going to answer my prayer. I'm sure he does. Yes, he does. But we got we to look at the, the verses in the context in which it was supposed to be written. Right here. It's right here. And we see God using Elijah to speak to the king, Ahab, says, there will be droughts that will be coming. Now, going a little backwards, now, where did Elijah get the idea of this drought? Was it him? Was, it, was he making the decision of the punishment for the Israelites? Let's go into uh, uh, Deuteronomy. Chapter 11, 16, 17 says this, But be careful, or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you, and he will shut up the heavens so that they will not rain, and the ground will yield no produce, and you will soon perish from the good land the Lord is giving you. This was God's promise to the Israelites. See, there were two promises that God made before the Israelites went into the, into the promised land. One was that if you obey and follow me, I will be with you. You will prosper. And the other promise is if not, this is what's going to happen. See, we look at God's promise as something that's positive. We want it to be positive. Yeah, God is for me. Who can be against me? Absolutely. But do you, we have to understand God's promise also includes punishment. Because he is God. When he says, 
that there will be no rain. And if you disobey my word, then this is going to happen. And that is a promise. And we see God's promise working here. And I'm sure the prophet Elijah knew of this promise. And then when the king disobeyed and, le- and leading the Israelites away from God and worshiping false gods, he says, this is what's going to happen. And we read that in chapter 17 in 1 Kings. Now, as we go deeper into the word, that was the drought. Now, in James, it says that the rain started again, that God provided rain. Now, to look at that in a context, we have to go to the verse, uh, chapter 18 in 1 Kings. And it says this. Verse 1 says, After a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. This is where we see the prayer of Elijah. It says, Who instigated this? Who is the author of this rain? It's God himself. Elijah was an instrument for God to say, now it's time. After three and a half years, now it's time. I need you to go to Ahab and present yourself to him. Now, if if you have time to read this chapter 18, it's, it's, it's fantastic because we see tremendous things happening here. We see the false God and the righteous God coming and, 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 and knowing who the true God is. I'm just going to couple, summarize a couple of things and highlight a couple of things. Now, after this, Ahab goes and, and, and confronts uh, uh, King Ahab. Now, in verse 16, oh, I'm sorry, it's not here, but verse 16, I want to read this. So, Obadiah, uh, went to meet Ahab and told him that Ahab went to meet Elijah. So when he saw Elijah, this is Ahab, King Ahab, saying to Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? That is amazing. He is blaming the drought and all of these things that's happening in the land upon Elijah. But we know that it is because of him, his father, and his predecessor, and in leading his people away from God is the cause of this drought. And then he goes on, and then, and then Elijah said, replies, no, it's not. It is you. You have caused this. You and your family has caused this. And then Elijah finally goes, you know what? I need you to do this for me. Summon all the people over Israel, all the leaders of the Israel. And not only that, bring them to Mount, Mount Carmel and then bring all of your prophets, your false prophets of Baal, and bring all of your Asherah uh, 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 prophets and bring them to here. And we will settle this. For, some, for whatever reason, Ahab agrees. And then he bring, gathers all his people to this Mount Carmel. And then there, he says, Elijah goes, all right, now, since everybody's here, we're going to settle this once and for all. And he says, offer up two, two bulls, one for your God and one for my Lord. You're going to slaughter it, prepare it, and then you're going to prepare an altar and then we're going, and then except for fire, do not burn it. And then whoever accepts this worship with fire, we will know who true God is. And it goes on, the verse 25 here in First King. So Elijah says, you know what? You get the, you, you, can, you can go first. I'll let you have it. Because that was, that tells us something about Elijah. Because whoever goes first, and if God answers without fire, that is, that is who the true God is. But Elijah knew who the true God was. And he says, you know what? You can have the home, home corner vantage. Go ahead. Go first. 
So, here we go. It says, Elijah said to Prophet Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull and then prepared it. And then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Literally from the morning till afternoon, they are screaming, they're shouting, and they're saying, God, bring a fire upon this worship, this sacrifice. And then here, in verse 27, Elijah starts to make fun of them. It says, at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. It says, shout louder, he said. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he's deep in thoughts or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted even louder. They slashed themselves with swords and spears. And the blood started to flow. And they were doing this all up in the mid, late afternoon. By midday pass, they continued this frantic prophesying until it was evening. But there was no re- response, no answer, and no one was even paying attention. And after all this entire day of screaming and just making a mess and, 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 and just cutting themselves. In verse 30, verse 30, Elijah says this. He goes, now, now are you done now? And he says, he says to all the people in, in verse 30, he goes, come here to me. He says, you're done now. Now I need you to come to me. Come to me and listen to what I'm going to tell you now. And then he starts to prepare the altar. He puts the sacrifice on top of the altar. And then he puts 12 stones around the altar. And as he puts those 12 stones that represent the uh, the tribes of descendants of, uh, of Judah or Jacob, And as he's doing this, he says to them, your name shall be Israel. Some of us have need to hear that message today. Your name shall be Israel. You are God's children. You don't belong to Baal. You don't belong to any false god. You belong to the righteous and the living God. He reminds them of who they are. Some of us here need to be reminded of who you are this morning. Some of us, we have gone so astray that we just come for sake of coming because that's something we do on Sundays. But let it be known, you are a child of God and let that comfort you this morning let that encourage you this morning to come and bow down before God and then worship him and as he makes his statement he asked him to you know what we're not done yet pour three full jars of water on top of this this altar because I'm going to make once and for all, I'm going to show you who the true one God is. So it was a pool of water around this, this altar. And after that, he says, and then verse 36, he goes on to say that at the time of sacrifice, the prophet has stepped forward. And what did he do? He bowed down and he, he prayed. And this is what he said. Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Let it be known today that you are God of Israel and that I am your servant. Have done all these things at your command. You can stop right here for a minute. I have done all these these things at your command. See, what Elijah did in his prayer was not his idea. What his thought of 
of giving uh, the Israelites their punishment, but rather all these things are what at your command. And he goes on to saying, answer me, Lord, answer me. So these people will know that Lord, you're, uh, you are uh, Lord are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Saying, all these things that we, I have done right now, it's because of your command. Not only that, the ultimate purpose for this is right here so that they can come back to God, to turn their hearts back to the Lord. Now, seeing from this context, when we go back to James 5, verse 17, it's very different now, isn't it? It's not about my zeal. It's not about my earnest praying that God will answer. Yes, I'm not saying that that's not possible. But what I'm saying is there's a purpose in that prayer. And I want to say this to you. We went through, Pastor Joe went through for the last, what, five months. We covered many different topics of how to live lives. And I wrote it down here. He covered faith and endurance. He covered, you know, overcoming trial and temptation, favoritism, faith and, uh, that saves, controlling your tongue, humbling yourself, God's plan, and prayer for life. All these things represent our faith, living on our faith in Christ. But I want to tell you this. This last four verses, I believe it encompasses everything of James. Because ultimately, why do we want to be like Christ? Why are we asking to be sanctified in him and be like him? Why are we asking to have the zeal and the passion that Christ has? Why do we want to be, become and, and live this Christian and to live out this faith? Ultimately, it comes down to this is to share that faith with others. It's about the salvation message. I truly believe this, is that when a, a believer has matured, has died to themselves, has denied themselves, and as a seed dies and withers and, and, and starts to rot, then we see plants, we see grow. We see tro uh, trees grow. And not only that, we see plants as it grows and as it shoots up, we see what? Fruits starts to bear. And from that fruit, we, under we know the identity of that particular tree. That is the same thing that happens here. The ultimate fruit that we as Christians have is to share the truth, which is the salvation message, and bringing those who are away from God back to God, those who are non-believers to God. And after this happens, we see after Elijah's prayer, we see in verse 38, it says, the fire of the Lord fell upon it and burned the sacrifice, the wood, the stone, the soil, and licked up all the waters in the trench, it consumed everything, everything. And I want to kind of, remind, there's an irony to this uh, as well. If you go back to verse, uh, first verse of uh, uh, chapter 18 of uh, 1 Kings, it said that I'm going to promise you rain. Yes, right? But here we see fire. Fire came before rain. Why? Why? Because we know that the word of God said that I'm going to bring rain. Why fire? I believe this is the case. The Israelites were so away from God and they were saturated in their sins. They need not just a physical healing. What they needed most was spiritual healing. 
they needed to be forgiven. And to be forgiven, you need to offer up a sacrifice. And that fire represented the sacrifice for their atoning sin. That was what they needed the most. We pray. Does God answer your prayer? A lot of you, when I ask that question, you'll say probably no. I want to remind you of this. Sometimes God doesn't answer your prayer because he knows what you really need. We ask for rain, but sometimes God gives us fire because that is what we need the most. And when that is taken care of, when our spiritual aspect is taken care of, then God will take care of the rest. This is what's happening. Fire before rain. And after this, we see the people, uh, people of Israelites saying, he fell, they fell on the ground and they prostrated themselves and they started crying out to the Lord and says, he is God. Lord, he is God. He was glorified at the end. And when, after that, as at the end of the chapter, we see rain coming down like it never came down before. And it nourished the land. This, uh, I don't know who shared this with me, but this is a picture of China in Wuhan. You guys know that we have an epidemic right now uh, with coronavirus. As you guys know, I, I, I work in public health, uh, and, and because of this, I am really busy right now. Um, and someone, uh, this is from Heart Cry. This is the uh, mission organization that Paul Washer leads. And uh, he shared this. Uh, basically, when the coronavirus hit, um, the whole city was just pretty much in chaos. And if it was in lockdown, you couldn't get out of the city, and they still can't now. So the Heart Cry and the missions, these are Chinese natives, they decided this is time to go share the gospel. What better time to go share the gospel message? And then they would don this protective gear, which is in yellow. They would wear their mask and their goggles, and they would go out and bring tracts and, and bring, bring pamphlets, and they would share the gospel message. And the irony of this is, this is that they would go and share the gospel message with the police officers that were kind of going around to make sure that people are not, you know, or, or, you know going out of the zones, the, the protective zones. And they would share and they would give free masks to them. And then one by one, they would take it, they would hear the message. And then as these, uh, uh, these missionaries would go, would go around sharing the gospel, they would, other police officers would come asking for masks and asking for what this track is about. This is the irony. In China, you can't share the gospel message openly like this. And those that who will catch you are the police, uh, policemen. Now the policemen are going to them asking, what are you doing? What message are you sharing? You see the irony in this? And then now, this is so prevalent now, is that this yellow symbolizes for them now hope. When they see someone wearing this yellow uh, protective gear, they know, hey, I can go to them and I can, I can receive the truth. And I can receive, of course, free mask. But the ultimate truth is what? What they get is what? The word of God. And sharing the gospel message. I believe this is the mark, the ultimate mark of a Christian life for you and me to live out our very calling, to live out the very great commission that has given to us and I'm so thankful that I'm part of this church where we believe in training our lay folks to live as missionaries to go out into the ends of this earth in their workplaces in your family in your campuses and to live and to have a mindset of missionaries and to be able to dispatch your high school to their campuses as lay missionaries and to train our, our college students as they graduate and then train them as missionaries to their workplaces I am so grateful for this church because we do believe and we do follow what the word teaches us. And I want to encourage you today. 
as we end this, James, as we look at the Christian life. Yes, all those things that, that Pastor Joe mentioned, these are all vital things. But ultimately, the, everything that encompasses that puts us together as a Christian life that understands to live our faith out is this. I want to encourage you. Have you ever shared the gospel message with anyone? You've come to church for many, many years, but you never utter a word of the gospel message. I want to encourage you to do so. Start praying. Ask God to give you and fill you with the Holy Spirit, just like the disciples. And, that, that, and as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we are, what, empowered to go out and share the gospel message. So I want to end with today to encourage you that Christian life is all about the salvation message. And I hope that you believe that. I hope that that will be, come to fruition in your life and that through this, that your life and, and, and your, uh, your community, your household, and everyone that you come into contact with will uh, find true, true power in that message and for your life and for their lives to be changed forever. Amen? Let's pray together.